Hey guys, this is Mitch with Fine Point CGI, and today we're going to talk about how to make a LAN based server browser inside of Godot. So we're going to talk about how to actually do low level UDP packet pushing and how to broadcast on an IP address. I also talk about how to consume your packets and translate that into data that you can use inside of your game. The nice thing about this is this is a way more lower level networking tutorial than what my previous one was. So it'll give you a lot more information on kind of how this stuff actually works. So we're gonna go through and build that part. We're also gonna build a server browser and allow you to click on the join button and join the game. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, now the first thing you might be wondering is, hold on, why do we have a scene already here, right? Normally when I do my tutorials, it starts from scratch, right? We start from the beginning. Well, since a land-based server browser is something that requires multiplayer to already be pre-built, I have already pre-built all of this. Now, if you want to know how to build all of this, I do have a tutorial on building this and I have a link to it in the description below. You can just go ahead and click on that, run through that tutorial. It'll tell you all the basics of multiplayer from building this to creating a server and hosting it out on DigitalOcean and things like that. Now, if you don't want to do any of that, that's totally fine as well. I actually have this project also linked in the description below that you can just use. You don't have to pay for it. You can actually use it for commercial purposes as well. I have no issues with any of that, but you don't have to use anything. You can actually do this tutorial without this, but I just wanted to make sure that I had something that I could show off and actually show the hosting and joining working together. So that's just something to keep in mind. Now, with that being said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click, add in a child node. We're going to add in a control node and I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to call it server browser. I'm going to right click, attach a script and we're going to call it server browser.gd and we will be like that. Now, here are some things that we need this thing to do. First things first, we need it to actually broadcast a signal. So if you needed it to tell everybody that a new server is around, we can actually create a signal for that. And we can do the same thing for when a server is removed. I think that would be good. Something else that we're going to need is we don't want to broadcast our server millions of times per second, right? So if we did it in the process, it would literally execute it every single frame. And that's going to flood the network really hard with packets. And we don't want to do that. So we need to have a timer of some description that says, hey, after X amount of time, so, you know, half a second or a second, we're going to broadcast our stuff. So that's something that we're going to need. We also need to have some way to actually actually hold all of our known servers. So servers that we are aware of, we also need a, a way to hold our server information. So let's actually start building all this out. So first things first, we need our two signals. So signal found server, and then we'll do another one. Server removed, and we're going to need a timer of some description. So we'll say var Broadcast timer, we're gonna make that a type timer, like so. And we're gonna to need to get a reference to that. So what I'm gonna do is come down into my ready. I'm gonna right click my server browser and I'm gonna type timer. That way we actually have a timer. I'll put it underneath my server browser. Call this broadcast timer, like so. And the process call will be on idle. One shot's fine, auto start on. We're gonna say every second, that's totally fine. And I spelled broadcast wrong. We'll have to add an A in there. So broadcast timer is equal to dollar sign broadcast timer. And I spelled broadcast wrong here as well. Apparently I'm going for very poor spelling day. There we go. And that's just going to give us some kind of uh, reference to a timer just in case we need to change it. Most of the time we're not going to need to, but just in case we need to, we can have that reference right there. Now we're going to click on our broadcast timer. We're going to go to node on time out on broadcast timer timeout. We'll click on our server browser and we will connect that and that's going to create this little bit right here. And inside of here, we're going to be able to do our broadcast. But first, we actually have to set up our server broadcast. So we'll come in here and we'll say func set up broadcast like so. 
and we'll pass in a name variable. And that's basically going to allow us to have some kind of name for us to use for our broadcast. Now we are going to need some kind of server information. So this is where any information on your server comes in. So if you have something like a name, maybe the user amount, maybe ping might be useful, things like that. So we'll come up here and we're going to create that. So we'll say var room info like that. And we're going to make that into a object and we'll put name colon space name comma. And I'm just going to use for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to use players or player count. Actually, I think player counts probably a better name. So we'll say player count. We'll make that equal to zero as well. Now, once we have both of these guys, that's basically going to give us some basic information that we can work with. So what we'll do is we'll just say room info dot name is equal to name. And then when we do our current players, we can basically just use our game manager for that. Now, if you haven't followed the previous one, this is where you would pass in probably your, your count here or something like that. But in my case, I want to just pull it from my game manager. So I'll say room info dot player count is equal to game manager dot players dot and i believe it's going to be size once we have that all we have to do is come in and actually set up our server broadcaster now i'm going to come up here and create a global variable for this so i'm going to say var broadcaster i'm going to make that type Packet Peer UDP. And I know what you're wondering. Okay, what is Packet Peer UDP? Well, Packet Peer UDP allows you to actually hand push or hand send raw UDP packets. So if you remember our previous tutorial, we talked about how to do RPC calls, right? And talked about how the backbone of all of that is UDP and TCP. Well, Packet Peer UDP allows you to define your own UDP packets and allows you to really get into the guts of what makes Godot networking actually operate. Now, I know what you're thinking, okay, but why not just do an RPC call, right, with my information? Well, when you're doing a server broadcast and you're broadcasting that information out, we don't have that connection between us and the server. We can't just stand up a server on this system here because if we have the server up and then users are connecting to us, getting our server information and then disconnecting, that's a bunch of additional logic that we're going to have to do. Whereas here, we can literally just broadcast our UDP packet and say, hey, we're a server, we exist, here's our information. And that will allow us to not have to do that connection and disconnection. We could just listen for that information. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So what we'll do is we'll actually create one. So we'll say broad caster is equal to packet peer UDP dot new like that. And then we'll say broadcaster dot set broadcast enabled. And we're going to make that true. What that's going to do is that's going to set our broadcasting to be enabled. So it's going to send the data to everyone in our IP range. And now we have to set a destination address. So we'll say broadcaster dot set destination address. And we're going to make this into some kind of IP. Now you can make this into whatever IP address you want. The best method for this is to come in here, type command to bring up command prompt and type IP config. And you'll see that I am a 192.168.123. So that means I'm in the 192.168.1 range. Now, in your case, you might be in something like, you know, 10.0.0. You know, 32 or something like that. So it's a good idea just to check to make sure. So I'm going to type 192.168.1.255. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Okay, hold on a minute, Mitch. You just typed 255, but you said that your IP address was 123, 192.168.1.123, right? Why are you typing 255? So 255 is actually a reserved address, okay? And in an IP range, 255 is called the multicast address. 
that is the address that you type in when you want to broadcast to every IP in that range. So if you were to type 255, 255, 255, 255, it'll broadcast to every known IP address in all of those ranges. Now, I don't suggest doing that because that's going to be horrifically poor for performance, but it is a way to approach doing broadcasting. You're basically saying, hey, networking card, I want to broadcast to everyone in my range. Now, once we have this, all we have to do is hit comma, and then we need to put a port in. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay, but we already set a port. If you come from our previous tutorial, you'll know that our port that we set it to was eight, nine, and 10, right? but we don't want to use that port. And the reason why we don't want to use that port is because if we use that port, what we're going to be doing is shooting data into a port that we already have in use, and then that's going to completely brick our project. So what we have to do is we have to use a different port. So I'm going to come up here and export out a var listen port, and I'm going to make that an int. Now I'm just going to make this the listen port like that. And I'm going to default this actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'll default it to eight, nine, 11. And you should default this to whatever port you want to use. But in my case, eight, nine, 11 is totally fine. And it should just work. And now what we need to do is we need to actually bind our broadcaster to a port. Now I know what you're saying, hold on, but we have listen port, but we don't have a broadcast port. Okay. And what I mean by that is ports work kind of like doors. You can't send data out of a port and listen on that port at the same time. Well, you can, but it's really complicated to do so. So it's just a good idea to just duplicate this guy and have a broadcast port as well. And I'm going to make that 8, 9, 12. And then we have to bind to that port. So I'm going to say broadcaster.bind broadcast port. And I'm going to check if there's an error. So I'm going to say var OK is equal to bind broadcast port. If OK is equal to OK, then print bound to broadcast port successful. And honestly, I probably should put what the actual broadcast port is. So we'll put quotes like this and we'll go str broadcast port like that. There we go. Else we know that it's not okay. So we'll say else print failed to bind to broadcast port. We'll put that as an exclamation point. And that's basically how we can set up our broadcaster. Now I know what you might be asking. Well, hold on. How does all this actually work? So what we're doing is if I open up paint, which is my favorite design tool. So on our machine, we have a box, right? A, like this, it's a pretty fancy box. We have a port here and a port, we'll make this red. And then I will draw out another port and I'll make that blue. So what we're gonna do is we're going to grab our second, oops, we'll make this blue. I'll draw this guy out, make this gray like so. And then I'm going to draw out a red line and I'm going to draw out a blue line. So you have a server here and you have a client here. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're broadcasting data from our broadcast port to our listen port. Okay. And since this is a client, it is not going to use this port here at all because this is a client. So this client is not useful, but the broadcast port is going to shoot out and hit our client's listening port. And that's how it's going to get the information. So there's going to be information here, like, you know, server info, basically. And that's going to allow the player to display server info like that. So what we're doing is we're binding our server's broadcast to this port, and then we're targeting this port here 
on our client. And like I said, our client could be any IP address. So basically what we're doing is we're firing this out to a router and the router is broadcasting it to every IP address in our range. And that's basically how this code operates. So how do we actually broadcast our data? Well, that's actually really simple. We actually have to say, hey, broadcast that information, right? So, so we'll come to our broadcast timer and type print broadcasting game. And then we'll just grab our server info and then dump it into our UDP buffer, right? But we can't just dump the information. First things first, we need to update our information. What if a player joined? during our initial setup, right? What if a player joined right after our initial setup? So before we do our broadcast, we need to make sure that we update our information and that we're good to go. So we'll type room info dot player count is equal to game manager dot players dot size. Okay. And then all we have to do is we need to actually make that packets information into json so we'll say var data is equal to json.stringify and we'll pass in our room info like that and then we need to actually create our data and throw it into a buffer of some kind so we'll say var packet is equal to packet data dot and we actually have some choices here so you can actually come in here and really mess around with some of this data. So if we type two, you'll see that there's a bunch of stuff here. So you can see to UTF-8, to UTF-16, to UTF-32, to char buffer. Let me bring that back up. To Pascal case, to bin to int, hex to int, right? There's so much different ways to do it. Now, what I like to do is I like to do ASCII to ASCII buffer, but if you want, you are always welcome to use UTF-8, UTF-16, or UTF-32. Now, you might be wondering what the purpose of the different buffers are. Well, UTF-8 buffer means it encodes all UTF code points, right? So it's one dash four eight bit code units, right? So Think of it kind of like um, if you're sending Japanese, right? If you're sending your Japanese across the wire, you can't handle that information. So it'll just kind of come up as a question mark, right? It'll say, I don't know what this is. But ASCII will do the first 128 ASCII characters. So anything that's outside of the ASCII range will not be useful. UTF-16 is the same thing as UTF-8, right? But it actually has glyphs as well. So it would work with Japanese. And UTF-32, right, has even more encoding, right? And I believe there's also, if you can do, I think, Base64. Does Base64 exist on here? Let me see. It does not, actually. So it looks like you can't do two Base64. So it really depends on what you need. Now you might be asking, okay, so what's the purpose of all of this? Well, generally speaking, the more compatibility you have, the bigger the data packet's gonna be. So you wanna make sure that you choose something that is within reason. So if you are targeting a Chinese market or a Japanese market or somebody that has glyphs like you know Arabic or something like that, you might want to use to UTF-16 or UTF-32. In my case, since we're using English, I'm just going to say to ASCII, that's totally fine. So just make sure you set whichever one you want. Just know that your packet and information is going to be a little bit larger than if it was a ASCII buffer. Once you've converted your data to ASCII buffer, you could just type broadcaster dot put packet and you can pass in your packet. And that's going to put your packet into a queue. So when you send information, it's sent sequentially, okay? And basically you create this queue. So think of it like a list of data. So you say, I have this packet or this giant jumble of strings. I want the broadcaster to put that in the queue to be broadcasted out. And then whenever the next broadcast is available or whenever it can, it will send that information out. Now, Godot handles all the sending and all of that stuff for us, which is really, really nice. 
So this is just basically how to put the packet into the thing to get ready to broadcast that data. Now you might be asking, okay, well, fine. So we can broadcast information, but how do we listen to that information? How do we actually see what servers are available? Well, if we come up to ready, first things first, on ready, we're gonna need to bind to our listen port. So we'll come in here and say, we'll come in here and basically do exactly this. So I'm just gonna copy this information, paste it and just say, and instead of broadcaster, we need to actually create a listener. So I'm gonna grab this guy, copy, paste and type listener. And then I will come in here, grab this bit here. We'll paste this guy in like so. And we'll change this to listener. So listener, listener, instead of broadcast port, let's type listen port. And I'm going to change this to listen port as well. Bound to listen port successful, fail to bind to listen port. There we go. Probably shouldn't capitalize that. And that's basically all we need to do. Now, you may not want this to bind immediately, and that's totally fine. So you guys can set this to wherever you want. If you wanted to have it so that the user has to click a button and then suddenly they're listening on that port, that's totally fine as well. Now, something that we do need to do is we need to shut everything down. So once we're done and we're happy, we should shut all this down. So how do we do that? Well, that's actually relatively easy. We can just use exit tree or something like that. So we can say func exit tree listener dot close like that. If broadcaster does not equal null, then broadcaster dot close like that. And the reason why we want to use broadcaster.close and if it's not null is because if it's not null, if it is null and we run broadcast close, it's going to actually just crash out our game. So we don't want to do that. And something else that we could do is go dollar sign broadcast timer dot stop like that. And that'll basically allow us to just stop that. Or if you'd rather have a function call for this, which I kind of do. So we'll say func clean up like that. We'll put this guy in here and then we'll just say on exit tree clean up. Now you might be asking, okay, but why? Well, if you look at my code here, I have host, I have join, right? And I have start game. So when the user starts the game, I'm gonna wanna clean up and stop my broadcasting, stop my listening, stop all my things, but I may not wanna get rid of my broadcaster. So it's just a good idea just to have that just in case, which means we probably should do the same thing but have a setup as well. So we may want to grab this guy here, cut it, and then just have Funk set up like so. Put this guy in here, then just type set up like that. And that just kind of breaks out some of our functionality, makes things a little bit easier to use. So that should help quite a bit. Now this destination address, now that I'm thinking about it, we might want to come in and create an exported variable for that. So let's come in here, export var broadcast address. We'll make that a string. And we'll default that to this value here. And then I'm just gonna change this to broadcast address like that. And there we go. Now I might be thinking, well, we're done, right? No, unfortunately we now need to actually process that packet and get that packet back, right? So we're broadcasting it out. We're sending it out there and, and throwing it out into the wild, but we need to actually pull back that packet. So what I'm gonna do in my process is I'm gonna check to see if we have any pocket packets. So I'm gonna type listener dot get available packet count is greater than zero. Then we know that we've received a packet of some description. And from here, we can actually process that packet. So var, server IP is equal to listener dot get packet IP. And then we could say var server port is equal to listener dot, and you'll actually notice by the way, we do have a lot of additional information here. So I just wanna let you guys know, there is a boatload of info here. I'm just gonna pull back the port 
and the actual IP address of this guy. So packet and port. And then I'll pull back the actual data. So we'll say bytes is equal to listener dot get packet like that. And then we need to process that information. So I'm going to type var data is equal to bytes dot get string from ASCII. And that's actually going to process our data. Now you might be wondering why, why did I type get string from ASCII? Well, this needs to match exactly what our broadcast is as well. So if I look at my broadcaster timeout, you can see I'm setting it to ASCII buffer. So what that means is that I need to get that stuff and I need to translate it from ASCII to a string. Okay. So if you chose UTF-8, you need to use UTF-8. If you choose UTF-32, you need to use UTF-32. So you just need to make sure that they are exactly the same. And once you have that, now you have a string of data. And now you can actually process that data using JSON. So var room info is equal to json.parse string data like that. And then we can actually print out our server IP plus our server port plus our room info like that. Now we may want to add in some additional quotes and type like, you know, room info like that. And then maybe do the same thing here and put server port like that. And then do the same thing here by typing server IP. Now, if done correctly, this should just work. But before we actually test all of this, we have to come in and do a few small changes. So first things first, this broadcast timer should probably not auto start. And the reason why is because we don't know if we want to broadcast immediately. So what we'll do is we'll come in here on our broadcast setup broadcast and hit dollar sign broadcast timer dot start. And that'll basically just start it and get it going. So that way we're not running this every on startup because if we have it bound to the port and our broadcast starts, then we're going to be broadcasting on a non-bound port and it's just going to break. So that's why we need to go ahead and do that. Now, hopefully this should work. We do need to actually run our setup broadcast and probably our setup function. Well, looking at this, we just have to run our setup broadcast. So let's do that real quick. So we'll go into our control node here, which is our multiplayer controller. And like I said, that's from the previous tutorial. You can just grab your multiplayer controller and just use it from there. We'll just hit dollar sign server browser dot. And I believe the function was setup broadcast. So we'll pass that in setup broadcast. And we'll pass in line edit dot text plus s server. And there we go. And now if we've done everything correctly, hopefully we can go here to our debug, run multiple instances, run two instances, hit play. You can see we failed to bind to our listen port. So that's not a good sign to start off with. So let's head down to where it says fail to bind to listen port. And let's see what it's doing. So first things first, we create a new UDP. We do listener.bind listen port. And I know that this is the only place that it could possibly be. Oh, it's because we ran it twice. That makes sense. So because we're running this twice, we actually need to run this on two machines because one of us can bind to the listen port and one of us can't. So that's actually intended behavior. So that's something that I was going to tell you guys about is that this this is why debugging is actually going to be hard because we can't just test on one machine. We have to test on two machines because we need to bind to our listen port. And if our listen port is already bound to, then we just can't test it. Now, unless we want to make it so that one of us, whichever one successfully bound to the listen port has control over that. And the other one is the one that does the broadcasting. Then we technically could test it and how I'm going to do that. So that way we can at least test it on one machine is I'm going to right click, add in a 
label here and I'm just going to say bound to listen port right here. So we'll have a label right here. I'll copy that. I'll put it underneath my server browser and then I'm going to say dollar sign label to dot text is equal to quote paste. I'll do the same thing here, false. I know that that's not the most ideal way to solve it, but it will definitely solve it. So I'll put it like this. We'll pull it out like this. Control S, refresh. And then you can see we have a false and a true. So this one is gonna be our listen. This one's gonna be our broadcaster, that's fine. So we'll click host bound to broadcast port we have a breakpoint invalid string int operator so my guess is that's under server port so we'll say int server port would be my guess but you can see that we do have some information here so room info we have our server name with player count one we have our server port which is zero that's a little strange our server ip which probably is going to be our own ip if i take a look it's actually empty so that's something to keep in mind I think if we let this run through you can see that we have our data so we have server port we have data name is an empty string plus our S server and player count is one. Our room info is right here. So that's pretty accurate. I do need to STR my room info like so, and then I'll be able to test it once more. So we'll hit refresh. You can see that this is our listen port. This is our non. So we'll grab this. We'll hit test host, and you'll see that we're broadcasting invalid operand string to int. So is our IP considered integer or is it considered string? Oh, because I have this as int, not as str. That's my fault. Let's refresh that one more time. False, true. So we'll say Mitch, we'll say Mitch host. And you will see if you look at this, we are getting back our player information, server IP address, the port, the room information, and the player count. So awesome. Now we're actually getting our player information. So this is great. So now we finally have something that we can actually use. So at this point, all we really got to do is just basically create a way to display that information. So I'm going to right click on my server browser. I'm going to add a child note. I'm going to add in a panel. And I'm going to drag this guy down here and put it somewhere in this relative space. I'm going to add another child node. I'm going to add in a HV box container and I'm going to create a server list. So we'll kind of drag this guy down here. I'm going to right click, add in an H box container inside that H box container. We need to have our title. So we'll put a label in there. So label. And then we need to have some kind of um, IP address, maybe if we want to have that, so we could do that. So duplicate that. That'd be something like 192.168.1.111, let's say. And then we can duplicate that and put number of players. So let's say like four or maybe five. And then we'll go to our HBox container. We'll go to our label here we're going to tell it to expand so we'll go into layout and go into container sizing hit expand that's going to expand this all the way out we're going to do the same thing for this guy here so we're going to do expand under layout container sizing expand and that's going to help break these guys up and then we're going to do the same thing here because like i said this is going to give us that little bit of um a buffer between all of these guys so we'll put that as expand and that helps make it feel pretty okay. Now, once we have that, we'll just name this as server info. We're going to grab the label, call it name, grab this guy, IP, grab this guy, player count like that. I'm also going to add in another server info like so. I'll actually put it above my VBox container. I'll just drag this guy up here like this. 
And then we'll put name, IP, copy capital P, and then player count. Like that. And we should probably actually add in the ability to join that. So we'll add in another one. We'll type join button like that. And that will add in a button here. And then I'll probably have to duplicate this guy and just hit join like so. And then for the button, we'll do the same thing. We're going to make it hopefully, let's see what happens if we do expand. I think that that's reasonable. So we'll make it expand. We'll scroll up. We'll type join like that. And that should about do it. So once we have this, we have our button, we have our server info. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click my server info. I'm going to attach a script and add in a server info.gd. We'll get to that in a moment, but what we'll also do is we'll right click that save branch as seen server info. We'll delete this guy here. So we'll remove that. We're going to grab into our server browser here. And whenever a person gets found, what we'll do is we'll have to do one of two things. We either A, need to go in and spawn a player server, and we're going to need to check to make sure that that server doesn't already exist. And if it does, then we might need to go and update it. So we'll say if dollar sign vbox container dot find child, and they're going to look for a pattern, and the pattern that I'm going to use is the actual name of our room. So I will type room info dot name and that'll pass back the name of that room info. Now, if you remember, if I scroll up here, you'll see that it's going to be a lowercase n. So I'm going to use a lowercase n and this actually returns something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill that. I'm going to say var child is equal to that. And then if child does not equal null, then we can go child dot. And if we take a look at our server info, we have name, IP, and player count. So I can grab this, get node, and I'm going to pull back a node. Now, the node I'm going to pull back is going to be the player count. So we'll pull back that guy dot text is equal to our data dot player count to like that. And I will need to str that. So str that. And the reason why is because if we find that player data, if we actually find the player data that exists, then we know that it's there. So we don't actually need to do any work. We already have it all. If not else, we're going to go ahead and spawn a player. We're going to spawn a server info, but we don't actually have access to that server info.tscn. So we're going to come up here and export that out. So export var server info, and we're going to make that into a packed scene like so. And that's going to give us, if we look at our server browser here, we're going to have a, we take a look at it real quick. Well, it's not compiling because we don't have this as pass. So I'll pass that real quick. We look at our server browser. It says server info and that is empty. So we'll drag this guy in. And once we have reference to that, we'll be able to instance the object. So we'll come in here and we'll just say var server info. Current info is equal to server info .stantiate, like so. And then we'll need to set it. So we'll say current info dot get node quote name dot text. And I believe it's a lowercase n. No, it's a capital N. So we'll say name dot text is equal to our data dot name like that. And then we'll need to do the same thing, but for IP and for player count. And I think that's it. So IP. And then I believe it was just player count. So we'll grab that like that. We'll say data dot player count. And then instead of data dot IP, I believe it's under just server IP like that. And now in theory that should work. And then we could just hit dollar sign 
vbox container dot add child and we'll add current info to that. And in theory, that should work. Now, something that I'm going to add real quick to my scene here is I'm going to add a add the ability to add in a um, extra user. So I added a button right here. I'll just put it over here. This is just for testing, but test add player. And this is only for the host. So I'm going to add this in real quick and we'll grab that into our control node right now. And we'll come in here and we'll just say game manager dot add dot players dot add. And then we'll just add in another player. And I believe when we add players, we need to add in this information here. So I will pass in instead of dot add, it's actually going to be game dot some kind of ID. So I'll say game manager. Dot size. Plus one. And we'll say equals. We'll pull back this information here and we'll put in name is equal to test ID is equal to one score is equal to zero. That's fine. And that should hopefully give us the ability to add players. Now, if I've done everything correctly, in theory, this might work. Now, I know what you might be asking. Um, with our server info, we have this script and it's not being used for anything. Don't worry. That will be used. It's just for right now. It's not being used. So we'll go to our multiplayer scene. We'll hit play. You'll see that this is on the listen port. So that means that we're not using this one. This one is not on the listen port. So we will host a game. So we'll say test host. It's going to broadcast and it looks like we might have a crash. All right, so we got pretty far. It did not pull back the child invalid index name on data. So let's take a look at data. It looks like data is a string. So it's actually room info is what I'm looking for. It is not data. So that's my fault. So we'll grab that. We will put our room info instead. So we'll copy this guy room info dot name name, name, and uh, player count. And let's try that. So this guy is bound. This guy is not. So we'll host. And we got another crash. Invalid set index text on label with value type float. That's because this needs to be an STR. It needs to be a string for it to work. So we'll do that. We'll refresh one more time, hopefully. So this guy's bound to listen port. This guy isn't. We'll host. And you'll see that we have our server, though we are getting lots and lots of duplicates. If we add a player, you can see that we have two now. So everything's at least working, kind of. Um, it does look like we have a slight problem where the name is not being set up correctly. And it looks like the IP may have changed here. So we'll need to make sure that we update that as well. So we'll hit cancel. We'll come up here. We will duplicate this guy to grab our server IP. So we'll just paste that guy in and I will pull this guy in and paste it. And instead of player count, we'll just grab IP for our IP. There we go. Now, looking at this, it doesn't look like this is coming back with any information. This guy here, judging by my head math, it should work. So if we host this guy, this guy should pop up. Put a breakpoint here. Room info dot name. Let's see what the name says. Yep, that's fine remote if we go into control server browser panel vbox container these guys are all named hbox container so that's a problem that's because when we set this guy up we didn't actually set it up properly we need to have current info dot name is equal to room info dot name so the reason why this is all broken is because 
when we bring our stuff in, we're actually checking the name of our child. When we do find child, we're checking the name of our child to see if it correlates to our room info dot name. Since it doesn't correlate because it's named server info or H box container, it just doesn't match up. So since it doesn't match up, it says, Hey, this doesn't exist. So now hopefully in theory, this should just work. So we're bound to listen port on that one. We are not on this one. We're going to host. And it's still not working properly. Well, that is unfortunate. So let's take a break point right here. Go to remote. We do have a, um, whatchamacallit server here. So that's cool, but it's still not working. It's being instantiated as current info. And then I'm assuming it's getting a name conflict as soon as we try to set it to the, um, proper name here. We look at our object information. It just says remote hbox container because it doesn't actually have a proper hbox container so what i'm gonna do instead instead of doing a fine child what i'll do is i'll say for i in dollar sign panel slash vbox container dot get children like that if i dot name is equal to room info dot name then we'll go ahead and update it like so and then from here we'll just break because we're not doing anything after this point anyway so we'll just return and then if it gets all the way past all of that then we'll just do this little bit of information here I think that will work. It's not the most ideal solve for this, but I think that will work. And then we'll just do I and I. Let's see if that works. So we'll hit refresh and we'll see if this operates. I feel like it, this should just fail, but if it doesn't, then something's funky. Nope, it worked. So something's just funky with how it does it, but that's okay. So now you can see if I add a player to my host, player count is now two. Add a player, player count is now three. So that's kind of how we can create a nice browser. So how do we take this and make it into an actual joinable game? Well, that's actually relatively easy. We basically just hook up our join to our join. Pretty simple, right? Well, it's not quite that simple, but it's pretty darn close. So if we come in to our server info here, we can hook up our, we can create a signal here and we can hit join game like that. And then we can take our button here. We can hit on button down, throw it onto here, and then just say join game dot emit. And that's gonna fire off that event and throw it up above us. And then all we have to do is catch it and then fire it off above us again, except for we should fire off our signal with our IP address. So we'll come in here and put IP, and then we'll come up here and hit dollar sign IP dot text like that. And that'll pass back our labels text as our IP. And then we can come into our multiplayer scene. We can go into our, I believe it was a server browser here. And we can come up here, put a signal in and make it join like so IP come down here and go funk join by IP like so. And then we can pass join dot emit and pass in that IP address. And that's basically moving it up the chain. Remember we have our guy down here. So if you remember, we have our, our stuff down here and it's gonna fire off its signal. It's gonna come in here, go to our join by IP, fire this join signal off, and then we'll catch it with our control. Now we gotta make sure that we connect that signal. So what we'll do is if this guy gets created, we'll also say connect current info dot join comma join by IP. And then we'll do the same thing up here with our control. So when we start up, what we'll do is we'll come up here and we'll hit dollar sign server browser dot join dot connect. And we'll pass that bad boy down 
into our join. So if you remember, we, I believe in my code, and again, you guys might not have this code, but in my code, we have a join. Where is it? I believe it is on join button down. We go and we fetch our address in our port. We create a client and we set our multiplayer peer. So I'll come in here and just type funk join by IP. And we'll pass in our IP and then we'll basically just grab this guy, paste it, and then come in here and hit join. And we'll pass in our address, which I believe was right here. And then we'll just pass in IP here instead of address like that. And actually it's not just join, it's joined by IP. So there we go. So now that join button will have the same functionality that it had before, except for this time we actually can, you know, use it with a signal. So we can come up here, we could basically say join and dot connect join by IP like that. And if we're correct, this should just work, hopefully. So we'll hit play. You can see I have bound to listen port is true, bound to listen point port is false. So this guy has to, to host. And now we got a bunch of problems. Invalid git index join on base hbox container. So that's not ideal. So let's take a look. So it's mad at us saying that we have an hbox container server info.gd invalid index join. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this guy back real quick. Hold on. So I'm going to do it the other way that we did it up here. Cause I, while I was doing it earlier, I wasn't really thinking about how I was going to handle this. So I'm just going to do it this way. Join dot connect join by IP. So we'll copy this bad boy. We'll come in here. And instead of doing it like this, I'm going to say, if I paste this guy, it's going to be current info dot join dot connect and we'll pass in our join by IP like that. There we go. And let's try that and see if that works. So a refresh it. We're not bound to listen port here. So this guy will host. We have another crash, same crash as before. So that's good. Hopefully it's a little bit more organized at least. Um, let's see what we have going on. So we, let's look at our server info. Our server info has a signal join game, not join. So we will copy that guy. We will come in here, join game dot connect, join by IP. We'll refresh those guys. Invalid index join game on base control server browser. Oh, I think it's because I actually made a mistake. Whoops. So this, we look at our server browser. This needs to be join game. The other one needs to be join. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to level these out. We'll go with join game because that's going to make things a bit more consistent. So I'm just going to do join game, join game. I'm going to come up to my control, join game, and that'll just make it all level. So basically I'm just going through the things I'm changing it all to join game to help make it all consistent. Then we'll refresh host. There's my guy join. So now I've joined the game and if I hit start, I have my two players. Hey guys, editor Mitch here. So something that we didn't discuss was these two signals. I think we can get rid of the server removed, but the found server, we can come in here and just pass in its information. So we'll pass in a IP comma port comma uh, room info like that. And then we'll just come down here to where we're doing our check here. And we can basically just come in here and say found server dot emit. And then we could just pass in that information. So if I remember correctly, we said that we were going to pass in the IP. So server IP comma server port comma and then room info like that and that will admit that guy and then we should also have one here as well that is update server so we'll say update underscore server like that and then we'll basically come down to the same exact spot here where we're doing our update and we can basically do update server dot emit and then we can just pass in our same exact information right here. 
And the only reason why I have this is just basically so that we can know if a server comes in or if it doesn't come in, things like that. So it's just useful for the for an end user to use or for us later if we need to expand this system. Now, something else that we did is if we go up here, we do have a reference to our broadcast timer here. And I actually must have spaced on it during the process here because I have different broadcast timers here where I just do dollar sign broadcast timer. And so I actually don't need to go dollar sign broadcast timer dot stop. I can just do broadcast timer stop. It's nothing major, but it's just something small that I noticed that uh, I did not talk about. I also spelled listener wrong. I spelled it listener. So it's L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R. So that's something to keep in mind. So I'll just come in here and I'll find each listener and I'll just rebind it. So that way it's spelled properly. I can't believe I made that mistake as well, but that's just how it goes. Sometimes when you're doing these tutorials, it, it tends to make you go tunnel vision. So there we go. And I think that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and get back to the video. Awesome. So now at this point, we've gotten pretty far into this tutorial. And something that people have asked for is basically how could I make a player browser? So when a player joins, we actually display that information and I'll cover that in the next one. Um, unfortunately, this one's probably like an hour and a half long at this point because we talked about dumping actual UDP packets and I really needed to explain how all that would work. So I'm gonna have to leave it here for today, but we did cover uh, building out a basic UDP push and put packets. I talked about how to consume UDP packets. I talked about how to encode your packet so it actually passes data. And I talked about how to actually display server information on your screen and how to hook it all up so that you can join your level. So if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. Hey, you know, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit the dislike button because I'm here to make content for you guys. This video, as with all of my videos, was a viewer suggested video. So please, if you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to take a look at them. Next up on my list with this guy is to actually go in and do WebRTC and talk about that. WebRTC is a whole monster in itself, but it is the most common way to do multiplayer for indie games. So I feel like it's going to be the best method for us, for our game, for it to work because it requires virtually no server infrastructure and it allows you to do multiplayer matchmaking as well. So it's a really powerful system that will help us out. So if you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below. But if you guys have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments below or hit me up on Discord. I am always available to help you guys out. As long as I'm awake, I generally try to get back to you as soon as I can, so please, if you have problems, hit me up. I'm always available. But that is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching. And I will see you all next time. Thanks.